This video contains every popular theory that I've gone over for Poppy Playtime Chapter 3. Feel free to talk with each other in the comments about what you think actually happened in this chapter. And if you want to help out the channel in its growth, leaving the video to play in the background while you do some chores, homework, or while you go to sleep will be greatly appreciated. But with all that being said, enjoy every popular theory of Poppy Playtime Chapter 3. What was the hour of joy? At the end of the game, once we get Catnap killed by the prototype, we finally plug the large battery into its respective socket and meet up with Poppy after turning on the gas production zone. And she begins to praise us for all that we've done and presents a tape to us that they liked to call the hour of joy. And just from what was shown on the tape, we can guess that this was the moment where all of the toys decided to rebel against all of the staff and scientists for experimenting on them. But what actually was the hour of joy? What caused it? And how has it affected the story of Poppy Playtime altogether? Well, by the end of this video, everything will make perfect sense. The hour of joy was a major event that occurred at the Playtime Co. factory on August 8th, 1995. This tragic incident was caused by the Bigger Bodies Initiative, which was the trigger that led to Playtime Co.'s orphan slash employee experiments an eventual downfall and it would set in motion the events of poppy playtime the hour of joy was planned and orchestrated by the prototype who wanted bitter revenge on playtime co because of the experiments and it resulted in every single human being in the factory being brutally murdered and afterwards the corpses were brought down to the deepest depths of playtime co to be eaten now that's the simplified version but what really happened on that tape well, at exactly 10.45 a.m., Kissy Missy was being relocated to Playcare via a train. 15 minutes later, exactly at 11 a.m., the prototype and his allies initiated a massive rebellion against the employees. In the tape shown by Poppy, Huggy Wuggy is first seen ambushing and attacking employees in the main lobby and presumably off screen, killing the scientists a bit after. Next, Mommy Longlegs is shown killing people at the game station by lifting them up and dropping them from a lethal height. Another employee at water treatment is seen being swarmed and possibly devoured by a mob of mini smiling critters and mini huggies. The scene then cuts to a hallway in the school where Miss Delight and her sisters chase a man into one of the classrooms before showing Kissy Missy knocking out the employees that were transporting her. Boxy Boo is then shown in a hallway tearing apart an employee before catnap is shown in play care, seemingly looking for survivors while throwing a body onto the steps of the counselor's office. And the final parts of the tape shows various locations from the first three chapters, including Make a Friend, the Game Station, Play Care, and the Catwalk leading to Poppy's room, all filled with bodies. Although an emergency alert notice was sent out to warn the workforce, nearly everyone within the facility, both guilty and innocent, was slaughtered by the toys in the factory and for some reason you can also hear the event in the dream that we have after catnap attacks us in the counselor's office which honestly leads me to believe that the main character that we're playing as isn't who we think he is and if you guys want me to make a theory on that let me know down in the comments anyways the remaining survivors including leith pierre were forced to hide while attempting to escape and their fates are unknown the sudden disappearance of all the employees led to the closure of Playtime Co., though it remains unclear if any investigation was ever launched. The toys later refer to this rebellion as the Hour of Joy, with the monsters remaining in their previous locations. And again, the corpses of all that were killed were then brought to the deepest parts of the facility to be consumed by the toys as a form of food. Eventually, this food source either dwindled or was cut off, leading to various toys turning on each other to stay alive before the players return into 2005. Now, with everything laid out, 
there are some questions that need to be answered. Like how did the prototype even manage to orchestrate this event to where all of the toys were not only on board with everything, but they were able to communicate back and forth with him. It's been said that the prototype was monitored at all times. And this was due to the fact that he was a prime vessel for what they were trying to create. However, the attributes that the scientists managed to get out of the prototype severely backfired as he managed to briefly disable the camera that was meant to monitor him by repurposing the parts of the alarm clock in his room. And once the camera was turned back on, they noticed that the room was supposedly empty. And after one of the scientists checked it out, it turns out that the prototype was hiding in one of the camera's blind spots. But he took this opportunity to try and run past the scientist and escape through the open door. However, a scientist outside the room managed to close the door via a remote, resulting in the prototype killing the scientist that was still in the room. But why is this information important? Well, while listening to the final log tape from chapter one, we hear that the prototype managed to escape and go missing. And shortly after, the hour of joy began. Now, along with his unparalleled intelligence the prototype also has the ability to replicate any voice that he hears as during his conversation with harley sawyer multiple voices are heard when he speaks and to be honest we might have heard this ability throughout the entirety of chapter three and if you want to hear about that theory the link is in the description but it's entirely possible that the prototype utilized this ability to trick the scientists into allowing him to escape as well as to manipulate the orphans of play Tom Co. More specifically, Theodore Grambo. Theodore Grambo was an orphan who was turned into catnap due to his connections with the prototype. And again, if you guys want me to make a theory on catnap's origin story, let me know down in the comments. But this connection that Theodore had must have been after the prototype escaped, as Theodore drew a picture of what seemed to be the prototype under his bed. So with that being said, it's possible that the prototype was able to sneakily navigate through play care and let the toys know of his plans with some being on board and some not. However, it seemed like all of the toys were at least on board with the killing of the employees, but further plans were a bit different in terms of their willingness to play along with them. And Kissy Missy is a perfect example, as you can see her breaking out of her restraints and attacking the scientists. However, it's unclear if her attack actually killed the scientists, as it's possible that another toy came by to finish the job. And this would honestly make sense if you think about how Kissy Missy is regarding her personality and caring nature. She's willing to attack the scientists to stop them from experimenting on her, but nothing more. And this is probably why she's seen as an ally throughout chapter two and three. You can even put Dog Day in this category, even though we don't really see him in the Hour of Joy. Even though there aren't any dates to when Catnap in the prototype tortured Dog Day, the only logical time would be a little bit after the Hour of Joy, as it would make zero sense for them to be able to torture Dog Day while the staff were still around. So with that being said, it's likely that Dog Day was initially on board with the Hour of Joy itself just so the experiments would stop. But once he realized that it was going to start to go beyond that and start to steer towards a more sinister way of doing things, that's when he decided to stop, which led to the torturing. However, we do know that in order for the experiments to survive, they do have to eat. And again, it's said that at the very end of the Hour of Joy, all of the corpses were dragged down to a location where they would never be found to be eaten. And keep in mind, that all happened 10 years before we came back to Playtime Co. So the toys that are still alive must be starving at this point. And the only way they would have been able to survive is by eating each other. This is probably why we see so many dead toys throughout the factory. And the ones who did this are likely the toys who were parts of the Bigger Bodies initiative, like Huggy Wuggy, Mommy Longlegs, Catnap, and even even the smiling critters. But overall, it seems like the hour of joy was the equivalent of one huge jailbreak, with one prisoner being the leader and orchestrator of everything. And I guess you could say that all of the prisoners killed and ate all of the security guards. As weird as that sounds, it's a bit easier when you think about it this way though, because I'm sure most prisoners would want to escape jail, but not all of them would want to go about it in the most violent way possible. And for the people that do, they have no problem disposing of the heretics.
What does the prototype look like? Throughout the time we've been playing, watching, and researching Poppy Playtime, the only thing we've been able to see on the prototype regarding his appearance is his robotic arm. But with how this character has been acting throughout the game, I might have an idea as to what this thing really looks like. But before trying to figure out his appearance, we have to speculate on why his appearance is even hidden in the first place. During the events of Chapter 2, we discover a tape hidden in Bay 09, a minor room that only serves as a way to return to the game station and after playing it we're informed about a tragic event that happened regarding the prototype where he nearly breached containment the prototype seemingly disassembled the digital alarm clock in his room using the battery along with some other parts to create a laser pointer which he then used to disable the camera allowing him to be left unmonitored for 28.3 seconds and once the camera was turned back on the room appeared to be empty causing one of the scientists to go inside and check to see if the prototype was still in there. Fortunately, he was, and he was just hiding in the camera's blind spot. But the prototype took this opportunity to run past the scientist and try to escape through the open door. Luckily, another scientist outside of the containment room was able to remotely shut the door before the prototype could escape. However, the scientist who went in to investigate was still in the room, which resulted in the prototype killing them. Now, this clearly shows how dangerous this experiment is. And it explains why we're having so much trouble with him. But there's only one thing that sticks out to me. The prototype has been said to have unparalleled intelligence. And this is proven by his ability to create a laser pointer powerful enough to disable the camera that was supposed to monitor him. Which means that it's likely that he applied these skills into other areas. One of those areas being himself. Now, even though we've just seen the prototype's arm, I'm led to believe that this thing already has some type of endoskeleton to help him move around throughout the building. Think about it like one of those endoskeletons from Five Nights at Freddy's. The only difference, however, is that his body doesn't allow him to enact on whatever grand scheme he has, which is why the other toys do it for him. Now, with all of the events going on in all three chapters, we know that not every toy is on the prototype side, but the ones who aren't can still be aggressive and have killing intent. Take Mommy Longlegs, for example. It seems like Mommy Longlegs was genuinely scared of the prototype, as when she's being dragged into the grinder, she yells out, he'll make me part of him, implying that she understood the prototype's goal in building himself up. Now, in one of my previous videos, I said that Mommy Longlegs said, you'll make me part of him. But after seeing what you guys had to say, I was clearly wrong. But this basically confirms that whatever the prototype looked like before the death of Mommy Longlegs has definitely changed. But we don't know if he took parts of Huggy Wuggy, let alone even found him, as when we ended up killing him, he fell way down into the depths of Playtime Co. And there's a chance that when he did land, parts of him became unrecognizable. However, we can bet that whenever the prototype is revealed, he'll definitely have a part of Mommy Longlegs on some part of his body. Now, this leads to the question, what would the prototype take from Mommy Longlegs? The instinctive answer would be her arms and legs, as she's able to stretch them out several feet, and they seem to be extremely strong as well. If you look closely at the Hour of Joy, you can see that multiple staff members were taken away by Mommy Longlegs with just one arm. So if the prototype were to take anything from her, it would definitely be that. But the thing is, he actually kinda doesn't. If you remember what happened after Mommy Longlegs was killed by us, you can see that the prototype only took her torso and her right arm, and the rest of Mommy Longlegs' limbs were messed up by the grinder. So does this mean that the prototype will have one arm for reach and keep the one that he already has? Well, with this thing being our only clue regarding Mommy long legs, I think we can see this as a possibility. But what about some other characters who died? For a while now, I've been led to believe that Catnap will be one of the characters used to make the prototype stronger, especially since the prototype has access to his entire body. And this includes his respiration system, which holds the red smoke. Catnap doesn't just have some supply of red smoke inside of him. No, he literally just breathes it out regularly. And knowing that the prototype has intelligence like no other, there's a chance that he'll be able able to extract that from catnap as well and apply that into his arsenal and if you really think about it there's not much else that he can take from catnap possibly his limbs so he can have some claws and a more agile frame but something's telling me that there's gonna be another character that the prototype will take parts from now could it be possible that one of those characters are the smiling critters to be honest it's not likely at all we pretty much know nothing about the smiling critters
Predator's abilities after the Bigger Bodies initiative, and judging by how fast they died, the prototype might not even see them as worth using. Plus, it's highly implied that Picky Piggy was the one who ate all of the smiling critters. So even if the prototype wanted to use them, he just couldn't. But wait a minute, Dog Day's legs were cut off as a form of torture for telling everyone to escape Play Care in Playtime Co. Could he also be an addition to the prototype? I think this is also a no, simply because the reason Dog Day's legs were cut off in the first place was to torture him. But then again, when we meet Dog Day in the jail cell, his legs are nowhere to be found. So they could have possibly been stored someplace else, or they just got eaten by Catnap and the mini smiling critters. Now, in the end of chapter 3, we hear Kissy Missy being attacked. And if you guys want me to make a theory on who did it, let me know down in the comments. We need to be cautious. There's something... But if we were to assume that the person attacking Kissy Missy was the prototype, then this could actually make sense due to one thing. Just earlier, I mentioned how when Huggy Wuggy died, he fell deep into Playtime Co. And it's likely that his remains weren't found. It's possible that Huggy Wuggy dying this way wasn't a part of the prototype's plan, and he wanted to at least extract something from him to make himself stronger. But Kissy Missy is pretty much an exact copy of Huggy Wuggy, the only difference being her color and more caring nature. Now, yes, this is a possibility, but if this were to happen, what would the prototype even take from Kissy Missy? Well, the only useful thing that the prototype can take is her mouth, as it has dozens of jagged needle-like teeth, and it could serve as an effective weapon for if he needs to kill anyone else. Another character that we can put on this list is Miss Delight, but to be honest, there aren't really any redeeming parts on her that the prototype will see as useful. Even her weapon can be seen as useful as the prototype already has a claw capable of killing the other toys with ease. Plus, it's literally just a bunch of sharpened colored pencils all attached to some random brain. We can also take Bunzo Bunny off the list because one, he has nothing going for him, and two, he was killed by Mommy Longlegs. And after being killed, his body is nowhere to be found, so he was probably eaten. But now, with everything laid out on the table, it's time to speculate on how the prototype actually looks following the events of Chapter 3. And the main thing that we're going to be using to help us is Catnap's shrine. Before entering into the playhouse, we can see Catnap praying to this weird amalgamation of toys. And after finally getting back to the center of play care, Ollie lets us know that Catnap made it for the prototype. But there's something that Ollie said that stuck out to me. Have a listen. If you thought that was terrifying, just wait until you see the real thing. Does this mean that Catnap and Ollie has seen the prototype? Ollie saying this basically means that Catnap was trying his best to make a statue of the prototype, and the statue that he made pales in comparison to how freaky the prototype's actual appearance is. So if we were to use this as our base for how the prototype looks, let's start inspecting the shrine itself. For starters, it looks like Catnap found a part of Mommy Longlegs, as you can see her arm and hand on the statue, and I'm guessing that this entire extent on the right is supposed to serve as the prototype's arm and everything else is just adding on top of his exoskeleton and for some reason you can also see the skeleton of a worker sticking out of the mouth of PJ Pugapillar. Now I'm not sure if the prototype will have the bodies of his victims but we'll just have to see. But one thing that does stick out to me is the fact that some of the many smiling critters are here. I thought that all of them were still alive because they joined sides with Catnap and the prototype to avoid death. At this point everything is just a mess, but one thing we can know for sure is that we will see some recognizable parts on the prototype once he's done with whatever plan he has. What happened to the rest of the smiling critters? Well, to figure this out, the first thing we have to look at is all of their cardboard cutout voice lines, and afterwards we're going to be analyzing each member of the smiling critters one by one all the way down to their personality and speculate on how each of them could have possibly died, starting with Bubba Bubba Fint. Bubba Bubba Elephant is the most intelligent smiling critter and acts as the brain of the gang. And this is even shown in the smiling critter's intro, as he removed Crafty Corn's painting to show a complex math equation. And his identity as a genius is based off the real fact that elephants have extremely good memory. His voice lines are also the most tame out of all of them, if you exclude the screaming, of course. What's weird about Bubba Finn's voice lines specifically is that when he's screaming, he's also laughing at the same time. I'm Bubba Bubba. Hey, 
I remember you! An elephant always remembers! Want to know what I remember about you? <laughs> and I might have a valid reason for this happening. However, before looking into that, we have to take a look at one of his normal voice lines, which could be taken multiple ways. Want to know what I remember about you? When Bubba Fint says this, it could mean two things. The first is that he's just expressing the fact that he has great memory, or it could mean that he remembers us working here 10 years ago. But you can honestly look at it both ways. Now, the reason I think Bubba Fint was heard laughing in his last voice line is because of how he and the rest of the smiling critters acted in the end of the episode. When the crew weren't able to sleep, they get a knock at the door and it's revealed to be catnap. And Bubba Fint was the first to come up and ask for catnap to put them asleep after everyone pleads for this however once catnap secretes the red smoke everyone including bubba Fint, is seen laughing maniacally now i'm not sure if the red smoke from this show has the exact same properties as the one in real life but it seems to show signs of insanity and addiction when someone inhales it along with them being able to fall asleep but with that being said there's a chance that bubba Fint's laughing in his last voice line is linked to catnap as he was initially exposed to the red smoke causing him to laugh and catnap took this opportunity to kill him next up is kicking chicken kicking chicken is known as the cool character in the smiling critters as he likes to keep his cool image and is shown surfing in the intro he's very determined and doesn't give up easily even in tough situations however kicking chicken can get scared like the other six characters in the show which is not only seen in the show but it's also heard in his voice lines as they first include him asking to go outside and hang out but after this he says that he's never been outside before and he asks for us to come with him admitting that he's scared to go alone trying to keep his image however he says that he'll step out first and soon after you can hear him screaming hey i'm chicken chicken want to go outside and hang out it's looking pretty bad outside i've never been outside before will you come with me i'm scared here follow me i'll step out first <laughs> But what does all this mean? Surely he doesn't die because of the sun or something outside, so why is he killed right after trying to venture off outside? Well, if you look at Playcare as a whole, it seemed to be some type of controlled environment that tries its best to simulate the outside world, which is kind of disturbing when you think about it. Kickin' Chicken most likely knew of this and Playcare's nature and was curious about what the real world was actually like, but I don't think his fear was because of the outside world itself. During one of our interactions with Poppy, she lets us know that the prototype will kill us the second we try to escape, so we have to dispose of him first. Prototype knows we're coming by now try to escape he'll kill you before you ever reach that front door and kicking chicken was likely aware of the fact that something would happen if he were to step foot outside of the building and once he tried to leave he's either killed off by catnap or the prototype now we have picky piggy a healthy eater who loves food and encourages her friends to eat a well-balanced diet though she also harbors a secret fondness for cheeseburgers and pb and j sandwiches her voice lines include her expressing her love for food but as you go on she slowly starts to talk about meals that are made of the rest of the smiling critters but even after this she says that she's still hungry and offers a friendship with us right after hi there i'm piggy piggy let's eat roast beef delicious grilled chicken down the hat seared elephant yum slayed unicorn mmm still hungry hey what do you say you and i be friends now, knowing this, it's clear that Picky Piggy ate all of her friends and still needed to eat afterwards. But now we have two problems. Wouldn't that get in the way of how everyone else died? And how did she end up dying after she ate everyone? Well, this actually means that Picky Piggy had to have been the last to die. On top of the fact that you don't hear her screaming or being killed in any of her voice lines. So what I think happened is after all of the smiling critters were killed by either catnap, the prototype, or natural causes, Picky Piggy was the
the last one alive, excluding Dog Day, of course. And to keep living, she ate the bodies of every single one of her friends. And after this, she had no more food to eat, leading to her eventually starving to death. Next up is Hoppy Hopscotch, who's said to be the friend everyone needs to maintain their energy and enthusiasm. And her personality is also seen in the show for the Smiling Critters, as you can see her playing soccer on a rainbow in the intro. Kinda weird, but whatever. And while sometimes being loud or impatient, she's still willing to slow herself down to please her friends. Now, the impatient part of her personality is very much shown in her voice lines, as she's convinced that if she keeps trying, she'll be able to jump to the moon. So she tries multiple times, growing increasingly frustrated at the player. But in the last voice line, when Hopscotch tries one last time, she's heard screaming while saying the word jump and the audio cuts out. And right before this, she said to not look at your feet and none of that matters. I'm Hoppy Hopscotch. Wanna try hopping to the moon with me? All three with me. One, two, three. Again. One, two, three. Listen, this won't stop until we make it to the moon. One, two, no, oh, no, don't look at your feet. None of that matters. Again, again. Jump, jump. Now, I think this one is the most obvious. Hoppy Hopscotch is somehow deluded into thinking that she can jump to the moon. And when she tries one last time, she didn't look at where she was and ended up jumping off some high platform, falling to her death. Up next is Bobby Bearhug, who possesses warm and appreciative qualities, similar to how Huggy Wuggy was designed. And she cares deeply about her friends and everything around her, maybe a bit too much. However, Bobby can also be seen as naive, as she may care about someone who doesn't have her best interests at heart. And she's also shown to have a fear of being abandoned as she asks the player if they're gonna leave her and that she's been lost a long time. Hi, I'm Bobby Bearhug. Wanna know how much I love you? I love you to the moon and back. I'm crazy about you. I'm lost without you. I've been lost a long time. Please take me with you this time. You won't leave me. I honestly think that this is the saddest of them all, especially considering the fact that Bobby Bearhug is the one who cares most about everyone, and yet she ends up being abandoned. This obviously leads to the question, why and how was Bobby Bearhug abandoned? Well, this might be due to her clingy tendencies, and the rest of the smiling critters didn't want to be around her because of how close she wanted to be with everyone. Or perhaps she was one of the last to be alive and couldn't find anyone else, which could explain her saying why she's been lost for a long time. And when she says, you won't leave me this time, will you? It's likely that she's referring to us leaving Playtime Co. and coming back, letting us know that she doesn't want us to leave again. And after having no one to love, no one to talk to, and nothing to eat, Bobby Bearhug slowly starved to death, possibly never being found due to the fact that Picky Piggy never even mentioned eating bear in any of her voice lines. And now we have Crafty Corn, a creative unicorn with a passion for art, sharing its importance with the other crew members. She also appears to be a peacemaker, seeing the beauty in all things around her. And in the cartoon's intro, she demonstrates her skills as a talented painter by painting an exact replica of Bobby Bearhug. Now, in her voice lines, it sounds like she's making another painting and realizes that she ran out of red. And once she's told this, she doesn't believe you and suspects that you're hiding more red from her. And suddenly, she yells at you to give it to her and screaming is heard right after, to which she says that now it's much better. Crafty Corn, can you help me with my painting? Thanks! Now, can you give me some red? More red, please! Out? But we can't be out. You're hiding more red from me. I know you are. Give it here! Now that's much better. So for Crafty Corn, I'm led to believe that when she's talking about red being hidden from her, she's most likely talking to a member of the Smiling Critters. And what's even worse is that she's likely talking about their blood. This is evidenced by the fact that once she yells at one of the members to give her some more red, you can hear one of them screaming right after, which likely means that she killed them for their blood. But how did she end up dying herself? Well, Crafty Corn could have either died due to starving to death or she was killed by the other smiling critters
murders after expressing her violent behavior and killing one of her friends. But for this member specifically, her voice lines don't really reveal a concrete reason as to how she really died. And lastly, we have Dog Day, the trusted leader of the Smiling Critters, always looking at the bright side of things and encouraging others in their time of need. In his voice lines, he tells the player to go fetch and then questions why we're just standing there. And afterwards, he tells us that we can't stay. But right after this, we can hear Dog Day screaming for a lot longer than the other members who died. Dog Day says, fetch, go, go, as far as you can. Why are you just standing there? You can't be here. You can't stay. <laughs> Now this one is honestly the most disturbing because we somewhat already know what happened to Dog Day. In his first voice line, when he tells us to go fetch, that's referencing his want for us to leave Playtime Co. And he questions why we're still here. And when he tells us that we can't stay and that we shouldn't be here, he's indirectly revealing the truth of Playtime Co. and showing that he doesn't agree with its beliefs, more specifically the prototypes. And so Catnap and the prototype torture Dog Day for encouraging the others to escape escape, as that's what they do to heretics. This likely explains why the screaming lasted so agonizingly long, and you can actually hear the moment where Dog Day's legs are cut off and fall to the ground. <laughs> This makes Dog Day's death all the more horrific, especially considering that everything he was saying in the cardboard cutout was pretty much the exact same thing he was telling us in person. Could Ali be the prototype? Throughout our time in Playcare, we've been guided by Ali to help take down Catnap and the prototype. He's given us keys to each building, knows the location of the generators, sometimes even the toys, knows about how Catnap became the monster he is today, including the shrine that he made for the prototype, despite it being in a cave likely with zero cameras around. And to top it all off, we haven't even seen this kid. But here's the thing, not once did Ali introduce himself himself as an orphan of Playtime Co. or even a kid for that matter. So the only thing we can go off of is his voice. But even then, there are some things about his voice that sticks out to me, along with some other things. But with all of this mystery shrouded around this child, is it possible that Ali could be evil? Or even worse, is Ali the prototype? Well, before we start to judge whether or not he's on our side, or if he's not what he presents himself to be, there's a couple couple of questions that I know is on everyone's mind. The first is, how does Ali have so much knowledge about play care? It's implied by Ali's voice that he's just a child, meaning that there's a chance that he was an orphan, a part of play care. But here's the thing. We returned to Playtime Co. in 2005, and we left Playtime Co. 10 years before this, so 1995. We don't know Ali's age, but if we were to stick with the assumption that he's an orphan, we have to look at the age of the other orphans, more specifically their date of birth. But hold on, the only known date of birth regarding the orphans is Theodore Grambo, and he was born in the year 1983, making him 12 years old before he was turned into catnap. It's unlikely that Playtime Co. would experiment with an orphan who was extremely underage, like under 12 years old, and even if they did, they would sound a lot older than Ollie 10 years later. But what if Ali was two or three years old when the hour of joy happened and he managed to survive all the way up until we came back, making him 12 to 13 years old. That is pretty much impossible. There is no way that Ali made it this far by himself and managed to learn almost everything there is to know about play care during that whole time frame. All of the experiments have been starving at this time and it's very likely that Ali has been too. So for us to figure out how Ali has so much knowledge about play care, we might have to ditch the fact that Ali is even a child. And maybe, just maybe, we might have to ditch the fact that 
that Ali is even human. And this leads me to my second question that you might have also had throughout the time of interacting with Ali. Why does he talk in such a weird way? If you listen to almost every piece of dialogue Ali has, there's always this unnatural up pitch in his voice, almost like someone trying to mimic a child the best they can. And honestly, they're not doing a good job at it. And overall, he just has some weird choices of dialogue. Like, listen to this. It seems like Poppy explained everything now, and she turned on the dome's backup power. You should be able to find a big power cord somewhere around the porch. Grab it and plug it in underneath the statue. Hey, did you see the shrine? If you thought that was terrifying, just wait until you see the real thing. Wait a minute, wait a minute, back it up. Just wait until you see the real thing? Has Ali seen what the prototype looks like? He wouldn't have said that if he had no idea what his appearance was. So how has he even seen him? We'll get to that in just a second. But Ali is just way too enthusiastic considering the environment that we're in. And even when Poppy's talking to us, there's always this sense of cautiousness sprinkled into it. But that's barely there for Ali. But enough about how he talks. Let's talk about when he talks. It becomes a common staple that Ali's main dialogue starts when you're in the center of play care, and that doesn't really change. But in the beginning of chapter 3, Ali is talking with us shortly after the train crash, as well as when he's guiding us on what to do in the gas production zone. Later on in Home Sweet Home, Ali's heard over the phone telling us to run, and then we see Catnap quickly hiding in the shadows behind us. But I'm led to believe that this was part of the hallucination that we experienced after inhaling the red smoke. The main driving force behind me thinking this is that we never actually do run and after this moment we never actually encounter catnap face to face and we only encounter a nightmarish hallucination of Huggy Wuggy and even after that we wake up still inside of home sweet home and if catnap was actually inside of home sweet home he would have killed us while we were passed out. So that makes Ollie's warning very likely to have been fake. So I'm not going to count this one as Ollie talking to us outside of the center of play care but he does talk to us again right after we enter into the school but before we venture off deeper into it he lets us know that we won't be able to communicate with us on this side of the dome and to be careful for Mr. Delight before the audio abruptly cuts out and after dealing with Mr. Delight we end up wandering into the playhouse, which we can guess is still on the side of the dome that Ali can't connect to, as right when we escape from the mini smiling critters and the bigger version of Dog Day, Ali immediately starts to ask if we're okay. Hey, are you alright? No ouchies or lost body parts? No ouchies or lost body parts? Yeah nah, this gotta be an imposter. Plus, it really just sounds like Ali is trying his absolute best to sound glad that we're okay, almost as if he secretly wanted us to be killed in there. Here is where things get a little suspicious, as when we enter the counselor's office, we stop hearing from Ali, even though Catnap was in here and attacked us, and he didn't even warn us about Catnap being here. Yeah, he was talking about how Catnap lives for the hunt and the fact that he lurks in every shadow, but I think it's weird that a Upon entering the offices, we don't hear from him at all anymore. It's only until right after we leave the offices that we get a call from Ali and he doesn't even question what happened to us and immediately lets us know that something has gone wrong and we have to plug the cord from the counselor's office into the sockets underneath the statue. Something's gone wrong. Grab the cord from the counselor's office and plug it in underneath the statue. We need to reach 100%. Now, it's very likely that he didn't know we were attacked by Catnap, but it's extremely suspicious that Ali stopped mentioning Catnap right after he started to pop up more. And I want you to remember what Ali says after we plug in the cord, because this is very important for what happens next. Now take that huge battery to the gas production zone so we can get out of here. After this, Ali tells us to take the large battery to the gas production zone so, and I quote, we can get out of here, which again is extremely important. But as we approach the battery socket, Catnap enters the room from a small door on the right, almost as if he were expecting us, and then we begin to run from him via an elevator. And after arriving in the safe room, we have to fend off Catnap for five minutes while he tries to get in. And after finally defeating him with the green hand from the grab pack being overcharged, the prototype 
prototype comes down through the hatch in the ceiling and Catnap begins to pray to him, not dying from our attack. But suddenly, the prototype plunges his hand into Catnap, killing him instantly and brings him up into the hatch with it. But after all of this, from finally diverting the red smoke to meeting up with Poppy and ending the chapter off with the nastiest cliffhanger of 2024, we don't even hear from Ali once. And I'm led to believe that this was intentional. But here's what's the most confusing about all of this. After leaving home sweet home, we're attacked by Kissy Missy and Poppy lets her know that we didn't do anything wrong and that we're here to help. But she also says this. I'm glad that Ollie could help you get this far. He's the reason we found you at all. Okay, so Poppy has some sorts of interaction with Ollie. We know that. But after Poppy shows us the Hour of Joy, she says that they killed everyone. Don't you think it would make sense that she says something relating to Ollie being a survivor of the Hour of Joy at some point in the game? But since she doesn't, then that means Ollie wasn't a part of the Hour of Joy and he's in Playtime Co. some other way. He couldn't have entered Playtime Co. after everything happened because of all the knowledge she has. He couldn't have been part of the Hour of Joy in any way because even if he was, he would definitely still not be a child. Plus, Poppy said that they killed everyone. The only option we have left is that Ali is not who he's leading us on to be. And not only do I think that Ali isn't even human, but with everything I've laid out on the table, it's very possible that Ali is the prototype in disguise, impersonating a child in some random location in play care with access to all of the keys and knowledge of the dome. Just think about it for a second. Let's say that Ali was some child. How in the world would he have gotten himself in some secured location where he has all eyes on us while we're in the main part of play care, is able to send us large batteries and keys whenever we need them, knows the lore about some characters even before they were toys, and with all that mystery, he somehow managed to have some sort of relationship with Poppy who doesn't give us any details regarding Ali even once. It makes me a bit skeptical about whether or not Poppy on our side, but more on that in the next theory. Could Poppy be evil? On the surface, Poppy is an innocent character who wants to help us take down the prototype. In chapter 3, she reveals that he is the one who trapped her in her glass case. He's also the reason why the Hour of Joy even happened. It's very convenient that we find someone like Poppy in the first chapter. She's a friend who's willing to help us uncover the horrific past of the factory, as well as defeat the entity that caused it to fall. But how do we know for sure that Poppy is on our side? In chapter 1, Poppy is introduced to us as the first doll who can talk back to children. We then find Poppy trapped in a gas-filled case, and we manage to free her. And in chapter 2, Poppy is happy and expresses her gratitude for us doing so. Um, I wanted to thank you for freeing me. I was stuck in there for so long. Thank you. I'd like to pay you back. There's a train station nearby. It needs a coat. Here, she has a very happy-go-lucky tone, but after finding out we defeated Mommy, something in her voice changes, and she refuses to let us go. You are perfect. Too perfect to lose. I'm sorry. I can't let you leave. This is due to Poppy realizing that we are capable of saving the toys at playtime, so her mindset changes. All throughout chapter 3, we are left with a very serious yet goal-driven Poppy, stopping at nothing to defeat the prototype. But there's a contradiction in her words. In the beginning of chapter 2, Poppy has a plan to escape the factory with us, but in chapter 3, she makes it clear that doing so isn't the right option. The prototype knows we're coming by now. You try to escape? He'll kill you before you ever reach that front door. So what's with the sudden change of plans? It could be that things changed after we killed Mommy Longlegs. This was the second enemy we had defeated on our own. It was also the first time we saw the prototype collecting limbs to build himself up. At this point, the prototype's attention could have shifted to us even more, and he would have placed more security measures around the factory to prevent us from escaping. So it wouldn't be safe to just walk out. It could also mean that Poppy switched her story, convincing us to stay so that we could defeat the prototype. But remember, Poppy herself admits that she had thought about defeating the prototype for a long time. Do you know how long I've been stuck in that case? Well, too long. I had so much time to think and reflect, time to figure out 
about exactly what I would do when free. We'll set things right. Is it possible that Poppy just flat out lied to us? She could have put on an act pretending to help, but never intended on us escaping in the first place. Whatever the case is, it seems like Poppy holds more power than we realize. Remember that note the player received in chapter one urging us to find the flower? Well, when we do find it, we see that it's a painting of a poppy flower surrounding a door, and behind that door is where Poppy was being held. Obviously, Poppy couldn't send this letter because she was trapped in the case all that time, so whoever did send send it wanted us to find Poppy specifically and free her. It kind of makes you wonder how they even knew that we were still alive after the hour of joy and how they sent the letter to us specifically, but that's the theory for another video. But as for why Poppy wanted to be found, perhaps they did this because they knew that she was a mastermind with the plan to defeat the prototype from the very beginning. Hear me out. In chapter two, when Poppy's attitude changes, her sinister tone almost sounds like a superior telling us what what to do. Did you kill her? Good. I'll board the train. We need to leave. Poppy seems to act very dominant for a toy who's only two feet tall. But what's important here is that she's establishing her control. We are capable of doing only what she wants us to do. Notice how Poppy doesn't seem to care about our safety or why we returned to the factory in the first place. This might be a stretch, but even some of the toys seem to recognize Poppy's power. Kissy immediately backs down after pouncing on us because Poppy says so. Dog Day refers to us as Poppy's angel, which implies implies that we're working with her, but as her subordinates, painting Poppy as some sort of god, similar to how Catnap views the prototype. Obviously, the toys aren't building shrines of Poppy or praying to her in hopes of saving them, but Poppy might just have some sort of reputation throughout the factory. She's clearly used to being an authority figure in some capacity, but does this mean Poppy is actually evil? Could she be a bad character with bad intentions? Unless you count the possible lying and belittling dialogue, Poppy hasn't actually done anything bad. She's yet to kill someone or cause purposeful harm that we know of, and the only person she has a vendetta against is the prototype. This is who she considers evil, someone who only cared about themselves and in turn caused a massacre. Can we really put these two characters on the same level when it comes to evilness? We could if Poppy and the prototype were working together, but there doesn't seem to be much evidence supporting that. Sure, Poppy has done things for us to distrust her, but what if it's for a good cause? Defeating the prototype is not an easy mission. We're up against who knows how many of his minions. They're tall, flexible, fast, violent, and just downright scary. We don't even know how many followers the prototype has in total. We also have to mention the fact that Poppy is very small and fragile. Plus, she's extremely old and she was made around 1950 and chapter three confirms the present date of 2005. So it's a 55 year gap. And unlike the prototype, Poppy hasn't been collecting toys to make herself stronger. She knows that she isn't equal to subject 1006 when it comes to size and strength. Her brain, however, could possibly put up a fight. Take a look at how she's described in her commercial. You are about to see the most incredible doll ever invented. Her name is Poppy, and she is the first truly intelligent doll in the world. A little girl can talk to her? Poppy gives her answers. She is the first doll actually able to have a conversation with a child. Now, this is kind of a stretch because they're obviously referring to the advanced technology that exceeded the 1950s, but it still does make a valid point. Poppy isn't stupid and she knows what she's doing. Scientists working in Playtime Labs have spent time, money, and energy into perfecting Poppy and her intellect. She can problem solve, speak, formulate plans, and think for herself. If there's a toy that could ever match the intelligence of the prototype, it's certainly Poppy. So what about her role during the the hour of joy. After showing us the last VHS tape of the game, Poppy says this. I remember hearing every moment of it. It went on so long, so agonizingly long. They tried to hide, to run, anything to stay alive. I remember their cries. What's going on? Why is this happening? What are those things? <laughs> Since
senseless slaughter. That's all it really was. But how could Poppy hear the screams or run if she was locked away in her case? Well, we don't know for sure when Poppy was trapped during the Hour of Joy. It could have been before or during the event. If it's the latter, then she would have had time to run or hide before being captured. Because Poppy admitted that she had time to think and reflect while in her case, we know that she was conscious to some extent, so it's likely that she was also able to hear the chaos, especially since some workers were killed right outside of the room she was trapped in. Whatever the real story is, we still have much more to learn about Poppy and her role in the factory. Whether Poppy is good or evil, we still don't know enough about her. Is Poppy truly our friend or the real antagonist of the game? Perhaps she's neither, someone who can be deceitful but only for the greater good. How did Poppy and Kissy Missy meet up with each other? After activating the power inside Home Sweet Home, Kissy Missy tries to kill the player until she is stopped by Poppy, who lets her know that we didn't do anything wrong and that we're here to help them. During the time of us being around them, however, it's clear that the characters share somewhat of a close bond with each other, as you can see Kissy Missy being as gentle as possible with Poppy. Even at the end of the chapter, when Kissy Missy is attacked, which I'm gonna make a theory on soon, you can hear Hear the fear and distress in Poppy's voice, showing that she was truly concerned for Kissy's safety. We need to be cautious. There's something. But how did the two manage to meet up, or even find each other in the first place? We know that in the end of chapter 2, the train that was supposed to be our way to escape changed directions due to Poppy, claiming that we are too perfect to lose, and we ended up crashing deeper into Playtime Co. And Poppy was also on the train with us, and we figure out that in chapter 3 she's perfectly fine. She wasn't found by Catnap like us, and when we do finally meet up with her, she hasn't really suffered any damage from the crash. But if you remember this one scene from chapter 2, we first meet Kissy Missy while we're trying to go through a gate and finish one of the puzzles. As suddenly, a door opens and Kissy Missy comes out and comes towards the gate. She looks at us and cocks her head to the side a little bit, trying to understand what our objective is. And once she realizes that the lever is what we need to continue, she pulls it down for us, gives us one last look, and walks away. But here's the thing, Kissy Missy wasn't on the train with us and she was nowhere to be found. So how did she end up being down in play care with us. Well, I have three theories on how this meetup could have happened, with my first one being that Poppy went to find Kissy Missy after the train crash to help her around play care. What's really confusing to me though, is why would Poppy abandon us after the crash to where Catnap is the one who finds us and tries to kill us? There's a chance that she ended up landing somewhere else after the crash and couldn't find us, and decided to venture off deeper into play care to figure out how to stop Prototype via some clues or just some items lying around. Around. But it's unlikely that she would have tried to do this on her own because it's clear that she saw us as the vessel to help clear everything and stop the prototype once and for all. Or maybe we actually did land in the same spot after the crash and when she saw Catnap, she ran away to find Kissy Missy so she would have someone to help navigate her through play care. But it's a little unlikely for this to happen as we can see Kissy Missy looking at a picture of a girl in Home Sweet Home, which might be what she used to look like before the experiment. But she she won't acknowledge our presence during this, and once we leave Home Sweet Home, this is when she attacks us. This little bit of info means that Home Sweet Home is most likely the location that Kissy Missy is at the most, and when we saw her in Chapter 2, that was just her wandering around the place because of her curiosity. And this all leads me to my second theory, and I'm gonna say that Poppy didn't even know that Kissy Missy was still alive and managed to find her wandering around play care. Now we know that Poppy at least knew that Kissy Missy existed as if you look at the Hour of Joy tape that Poppy shows us in the end of chapter 3, you can see that Kissy Missy is one of the experiments to attack the staff and was a part of the killing, which honestly contradicts her docile behavior and the way she acts with Poppy. So how did they become friends and not even just meet up? 
Perhaps Kissy Missy only attacked the staff who were experimenting on her and left the other ones alone. Or she just attacked the people that she recognized as staff who were experimenting on the other toys. But anyway, it wouldn't make sense for Poppy to have already seen the tape and not acknowledge Kissy Missy's actions, let alone her existence. But it's likely that Poppy thought Kissy Missy had either been killed or starved to death. But how would that be the case? Well, when Kissy Missy attacks us in chapter 3, Poppy has to tell her that we're an ally and that we're here to help, meaning that Kissy Missy had no idea of our purpose being here. Which honestly doesn't make a lot of sense at all due to two things. The first is that she helped us complete a puzzle in chapter 1, showing no signs of hostility even though we were probably seen as staff in her eyes. And the second actually includes Dog Day, as after navigating through the playhouse a bit, we come across Dog Day in a jail cell chained up to the wall. But listen to the very first thing he says when we find him. You, you're Pappy's angel. Come to save us. Okay, how does Dog Day know about our existence, but Kissy Missy doesn't? Even though we encounter Kissy Missy first, and Poppy is seen going around play care with her. It's not like Kissy Missy doesn't understand what Poppy tells her, and it seems like she understands English completely. So maybe Poppy just didn't tell her about us? But if that's the case, why would she leave out such a crucial detail? And how would Dog Day know about this detail before Kissy Missy? If you guys want me to make a theory just about that alone, let me know down in the comments. But I honestly think it's just weird how everything played out regarding Dog Day and Kissy Missy. Maybe Catnap told Dog Day about us after leaving him in the jail cell, but I really have no idea as of right now. But what if after the train crash, Kissy Missy was nearby and heard everything going down, and when she saw us and Poppy collapsed on the floor, she decided to take Poppy to safety and that started their alliance. And maybe when she saw us and Poppy on the floor, she thought that we were the reason as to why the train crashed and we died due to it. So she took Poppy someplace else and they decided to wander through play care together. And we never really hear Kissy Missy speak at all, so she wouldn't really be able to ask Poppy about us, and that might be the reason as to why the conversation never popped up. But even when we meet up with Poppy again, she doesn't seem surprised at all that we're still alive. Like she knew for a fact that we would live through Catnap's attempt to kill us. I'm glad that Ollie could help you get this far. He's the reason we found you at all. But that's assuming that she was around to even see that Catnap brought us over to the trash compactor. Not to mention the fact that Poppy said that Ollie was the reason they found us in the first place. So does that mean she found Kissy Missy after landing somewhere far away from us after the crash, managed to either find Ollie in the flesh or talk to him over the phone and then find us? Because we were the one who freed her from her box all the way back in chapter one. And not once did she mention the fact that she had already explored Play care in chapter 2. Plus, she said, and I quote, he was the reason we found you at all. He's the reason we found you at all. So this pretty much confirmed that Poppy found Kissy Missy before finding us, but everything else is just all over the place. So overall, it's unknown who went to find who. We don't know if Poppy went to find Kissy Missy because she didn't want to be alone, or Kissy Missy found Poppy because she heard the crash and wanted to make sure everything was okay. But judging by how nice they are to each other, especially with how gentle Kissy is with Poppy, it's possible that they first met all the way back in chapter 2. If we were to stick with this theory, it would make sense as to why there's a chance that Kissy Missy went to investigate the train crash, as in her mind, Poppy must have been involved with it since they weren't together. But what's also weird to me is how some toys are able to talk and some aren't, as again, we don't hear Kissy Missy talk at all, and when she attacks us, we can only hear a faint growl from her voice. Now we know that there are some experiments who are on the prototype side and agree with his beliefs, and this is most likely why the Hour of Joy was so successful, but for the ones who aren't, specifically Kissy Missy, it's clear that they have some type of friendly aura about them, and maybe Poppy was able to notice that within Kissy Missy. What happened to Miss Delight? Upon entering the school to restore power to it, we are informed by Ali that he won't be able to communicate with us due to the location, and just before the audio cuts out, he tries to tell us that we're not alone and whoever's in here with us is not our friend. And as we're wandering through the halls of the school, we begin to hear a voice on the intercom, which we learn is Miss Delight. But she seems to be talking as if there are students still inside of the school. This is Miss Delight speaking. Please excuse the interruption. Students, 
Remain in your seat until the bell has rung. And no going in the halls without a hall pass. However, after navigating through the school a bit more, the intercom comes on again and it's Miss Delight, claiming that she recognizes us, saying that we used to work here and she questions how we're still alive. Wait, I recognize you. Yes, I remember. You used to work here. How are you? Alive. But then we hear Miss Delight supposedly talking to someone else in the background named Barb. But later, we find out that this isn't a person at all, and it's actually just the mace that she uses as her weapon. Miss Delight then warns us that we shouldn't be here looking for our co workers, and Catnap wouldn't be too pleased of that. Barb? Oh. Barb says you're looking for your co workers. Catnap wouldn't like that you're here. You should leave. But after venturing through the school a bit more, Miss Delight grows increasingly agitated at the fact that we are still wandering around, and hints at the fact that she'll be around to dispose of us herself. Not a good listener, are you? You're a lot like the other humans in that way. I wonder if your screams will sound like theirs too. <laughs> I look forward to finding out. And later, when the player powers on the generator, the door bursts open and Miss Delight walks into the room, breaks the generator with her weapon, sending the battery flying across the room, and with the generator now destroyed, the halls are back to having no lights on. But at some point in the game, we learn that Miss Delight is one of the only remaining teachers who was abandoned by her co-workers due to their constant need of flesh to feast upon. And she convinces herself that if she is stared at, she will be depicted dead which is a tactic utilized by players to restore power to the school before crushing Miss Delight in one of the gated rooms. But what exactly happened to Miss Delight that resulted in her going from a kind, lighthearted, and caring teacher to the orphans in play care to a deranged, unhinged, psychotic, mace-wielding maniac? And that was it. That's all he'd tell me. Probably because he knew I'd kill him all. <laughs> Well, to figure this out, we have to take a look at her backstory. Miss Delight was one of at least eight identical constructs who viewed each other as sisters, serving as teachers for the play care. They made sure to have the school seen as a safe place by the students and were as caring as possible towards them. And based on her cutout and intercom message, Miss Delight is a very kind and gentle teacher who speaks in a very soft and sweet voice. However, after the hour of joy, she and all of the other teachers were locked within the school by catnap. And Miss Miss Delight could have sworn that she heard something on the other side of the door breathing, leading her to create her signature weapon that she named Barb in case anything came through. And it looks to be made from a bunch of sharpened colored pencils, which are all merged with either a rubber band ball or hardened Play-Doh. But that's just my guess. Sometime afterwards though, her sisters cut her off from the little food that they had. And as time went on, she slowly went insane and started to consider her weapon Barb as an actual person. Person. Barb eventually taught Miss Delight that if she stopped moving and stood very still, the others would assume that she is dead and she relied on this tactic to ambush the other teachers when they wanted to cannibalize her. So Miss Delight killed them all one by one eating their bodies to wear off the hunger she had been dealing with for so agonizingly long. Sometime later, she found the door unlocked and discovered Catnap, who she guessed was the one who locked the door in the first place. The two then formed some sort of truce afterward, sharing the same views regarding the prototype and his plans to save everyone. Now, although it is never stated, it's implied that the reason Catnap doesn't go into the school is likely due to how disturbed he is by Miss Delight's unhinged nature as she can go from this sweet sounding teacher to a bloodthirsty maniac. Now I know everyone is wondering the same thing about her appearance. What happened to her face to where the toy version of her smile is completely broken off and the breakage even trails off to her forehead? Well I actually have three theories on how this could have happened with my first one being that in order for Miss Delight to eat the teachers she had to break off the toy version of her face as how would she have done it without doing so? 
so. Judging from her appearance though, it's clear that she got into some type of altercation with either the teachers or something else that could have been lurking inside of the school. But since we know that the teachers were trying to eat her to survive, it's likely that they were the cause of the tattered clothes and possibly her broken face as well. But for my second theory, I'm gonna say that Miss Delight's psychotic nature led her to break her own face with Barb as she's shown to have some type of mental instability. Now, this theory is a bit unlikely simply because we never see Miss Delight indulging in any type of self-destructive behavior, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was revealed that this was the cause of her face being completely mangled. But what's making me believe this just a little bit is just how the breakage looks on her face. As it doesn't stop at her mouth, it goes all the way to her forehead. It's also likely that she did this without Barb, and she either did it with her hands or something more precise, as if you look at her smile, the edges on where the smile ends look a bit too symmetrical to be some type of weapon smashing against her face. Now, even though the first theory is probably the most likely to have happened, my third theory is that someone else broke it off, and that's what led to her violent and destructive behavior. This also loops back to the other teachers, as when they were attempting to cannibalize Miss Delight, they probably had a weapon of their own and broke a large portion of her face, or they managed to rip it off and Miss Delight managed to escape from their grasp. But one thing that would 100% confirm this theory is if we were able to look at the mangled version of the other teachers, because if all of them had their faces broken off, then we would know for a fact that the reason they were doing that is so they can actually eat. This is also a very unique attribute, because all of the other characters have their mouths on the outer layer of their face, and it's not hidden anywhere. Now, if you look at Braun, you might be able to put him in the same group as Miss Delight, but we don't have enough info on him to really confirm this. But Huggy Wuggy, Mommy Longlegs, Catnap, Bunzo Bunny, PJ Pugapillar, and the Smiling Critters don't have to have any part of their face broken to reveal what they actually need to eat. Now, early in the video, I mentioned how Miss Delight convinced herself that if she doesn't move at all, then everyone else will perceive her as dead. But what compelled her to do this? Well, if you explore the school, there are cardboard cutouts of her character, the same with all of the other characters within Playtime Co. But I'm led to believe that Miss Delight saw that all of the students would walk by this cutout as if it didn't even exist, and she started to believe that if she did the exact same thing, then she would get the same results. Now it's clear that Miss Delight is downright crazy, so this could be one of the reasons as to why she decided to have her movement like this. Now, in case you didn't know, in the pre-release version given to content creators, Miss Delight would only move when the lights were off and freeze when the lights flickered back on, but it's unknown why it was changed. Perhaps it would contradict the fact that Miss Delight would break the generator and cut off the power completely, so the light flickering wouldn't make sense. Why did the prototype kill Catnap? After rerouting the counselor's office's backup power to the statue, Ollie gives the player the final battery required to power the gas production zone, and after being placed, red smoke fills the room while Catnap chases the player. The player then enters the safe room and is required to fend off Catnap for five minutes constantly as he toys with the player. And upon reaching five minutes, a green grab pack hand receiver overcharges and the player utilizes this to eliminate Catnap at the sacrifice of the green hand. While Catnap does not die from the player's actions, he's seen kneeling before the prototype's presence. And just when we thought that the prototype was going to help him, he ends up brutally killing Catnap nap and taking his body. Now, why does this happen? It's been said by Ollie that Catnap treats the prototype as a god. In Catnap's eyes, the prototype is a superhero and has saved this place. So Catnap treats him like a god, killing everyone that opposes him. And we can even see him engaging in some type of prayer with an amalgamation of toys and parts in Playcare Caravans, which is likely in devotion to the prototype. Not to mention the fact that the soul inside of Catnap, also known as Theodore Granbell, was an orphan inside of Playcare and was already influenced by the prototype, as he gained notoriety among the staff for his connection to an imaginary friend who seemed to encourage him to sabotage Playtime Co. In the Chapter 3 interaction, ARG, Theodore's drawing depicted him in purple, sitting on his bed while a skeletal arm emerged from underneath. This drawing strongly suggested that Theodore's imaginary companion was Experiment 1006, or 
the prototype. So, if Catnap's devotion to the prototype dates all the way back to before he was even a toy, then why did he end up being killed by the person he devoted his life to? Well, that brings me to my first theory, which honestly makes the most sense. And I'm gonna say that this was because Catnap failed in killing us. Let's think about the ending of the game for a second. Let's say that we didn't end up damaging Catnap and he ended up killing us right then and there. Would it have made sense for the prototype to come down and kill him still? From the prototype's perspective, Catnap was given multiple chances to complete his objective. As in the beginning of the game, instead of just ripping us to shreds, he throws us down into a trash compactor, which we managed to escape from. While we're in home sweet home, Catnap is seen stalking us from the shadows. Now, it's not clear whether or not Catnap popping up was due to the hallucination, but if it wasn't, he failed in killing us there as well. Even if Catnap wasn't there during the hallucination, we're still passed out on the floor in the real world, so he could have easily taken care of us there. But then again, we don't know if we passed out and then had the hallucination, or we were awake the whole time and our perception of reality was just being manipulated. Also, when we the player are sent to the counselor's office by Ollie to restore power, Catnap emerges from the gas and knocks us in some type of dream state. So at the end of the game, when the prototype sees that Catnap has failed yet again in killing us, it decides to just change plans and realizes that Catnap is not of use to him anymore. But what if Catnap kneeling to the prototype is an act of acceptance? Which leads me to my second theory. Catnap understands that he has failed and submits to the prototype, putting all of his trust into him and allowing himself to be a part of him, with the prototype's plan being to make himself and Catnap stronger in the end game. Now, what do I mean a part of him? Well, if you remember what happened back in chapter two, after surviving Mommy Longlegs' rigged hide and seek game and just barely escaping into a nearby room, the player then traps Mommy Longlegs in a grinder and activates the lever brutally killing her. But after this, a mysterious claw-like hand appears from the bottom of the partially closed door and drags mommy's severed torso into the dark before the door to the right opens and the player is let back into the game station. But listen to what mommy long legs says as she's being killed. <laughs> Now, judging by the few glimpses of prototype that we see, that being his claw, it's pretty safe to assume that this thing probably doesn't have the right type of body to do everything himself, which is why he has Catnap and a bunch of other toys under his command. And him dragging away Mommy Longlegs after her death is probably because he plans to use her attributes to turn himself into this undefeatable monster. But this is most likely his solution to if the other toys fail to kill us. But if they succeed, they get to roam around as normal. Normal. Now, going back to Catnap, I'm led to believe there's a chance that he would still be okay with the prototype killing him even if he was informed of this before it happening. As again, Catnap sees the prototype as his god, and if the prototype told Catnap that he's doing it to save everyone or told him that he's going to be rebirthed into something far greater, I don't think that he would fight back at all. But now for my third theory, which includes me still thinking that the prototype still killed Catnap due to him failing to kill us. But I think that the prototype already planned on doing this, but seeing that we were still alive caused a change of plans. If we were to stick to the theory that the prototype doesn't have the right body to do what he wants, then he would obviously either need assistance from the other toys or he would need part of their body altogether. And judging by what he's already done with Mommy Longlegs, it's pretty safe to assume that he won't have the toys a part of his plans the entire time. I'm led to believe that Catnap, along with some of the other toys, is being under prototypes command is temporary and in the end he'll kill them off and use their parts to make him stronger so if catnap did succeed in killing us there might have been a chance that the prototype would either still kill him because he finished his objective and the prototype doesn't need him as an individual anymore or he would prepare him for some type of merging process later on to where he's still able to use his parts but perhaps in the next chapter we'll be able to get an answer on why this happened because if you think about it if the 
prototype didn't pop up at the end of chapter 3, we would have most likely still been killed by Catnap despite us fighting back. As right after the flames subside and Catnap sees the prototype, he gets up and starts to pray to him as nothing happened. So in a weird way, the prototype saved us from being killed by Catnap. And we might even get to see what he's been doing with all the deceased toys. Who knows? He could be putting himself together with Huggy Wuggy's teeth, Mommy Long Legs' long limbs, and now Catnap's gas. Or more specifically, his respiration system, as that's where the gas comes from. Why does Huggy Wuggy appear in our hallucination? After entering Home Sweet Home, going downstairs to the red gas and roaming the halls, we the player come across a tape in one of the rooms. And after inserting it into the cassette player, we are greeted to what seems to be a normal introduction video to the new employees. But as the tape plays on, it suddenly takes a dark turn, with the screen switching from a regular looking Huggy Wuggy to a demented and nightmarish one. And with the tape speaking directly to us, a former employee of Playtime Co. Should you come back years later, your conscience finally getting the better of you, may you descend into the dark and the dust finding all that awaits you are incomprehensible horrors. And at the very end of the guy's speech, the demented Huggy Wuggy pushes itself out of the TV and into our world. And once he inevitably catches us, we wake up from the nightmare still inside of Home Sweet Home. But why was it Huggy Wuggy specifically that popped up and not Mommy Longlegs or even Catnat himself? Well, I have a couple theories on why this is the case, with my first being that Huggy Wuggy is the toy that we the player are most scared of. Now, even though we play as an ex-ployee of Playtime Co., the player's physical appearance isn't seen in game, and any surfaces that could reflect their appearance are shown as shadows. However, Chapter 2's files reveal that the player is a faceless yellow mannequin with a spherical head, similar to the survivors in Project Playtime. The player has not talked, and the only known information about them is that they were formerly an employee for Playtime Co., but either left their job, were replaced by another employee, or were fired before the hour of joy occurred. But it's also said during the catnap recall video that when Whenever kids sat beside Catnap, they would often have violent nightmares. However, parents across the country report their children experiencing strange and often violent nightmares, and beside them, their little, grinning Catnap doll. Now the hallucination that we experienced is probably what the video is referring to. Now it's debatable on whether this is a nightmare or a hallucination, but since we were able to get info about what happened regarding Playtime Co, i.e. a dismembered orphan in the building and it ruining Ludwig's reputation, I'm leading more towards the hallucination side. News this morning as of 9.45 a.m., local authorities report that the body of a young boy has been found on the estate of the late Elliot Ludwig as well as key bones from the skeletal structure were reported missing from the body. But instead of us having hallucinations about the person who caused it, which is most likely Catnap, we had it about Huggy Wuggy. However, we can still see Catnap every now and again, stalking us as we wander through Home Sweet Home. And I think this is due to the fact that Huggy Wuggy was our very first encounter of a living, breathing toy, and it left a scar on the employee psychologically. If you remember what happened in the first chapter, upon reaching the Make a Friend area, the protagonist activates the Make a Friend machines, which gives us a Cat B toy that has to be used as a key card to open the Nobody Leaves Without a Toy gate. However, as they approach the shadowy hallway, Huggy Wuggy suddenly appears and makes an attempt to catch the player, forcing the protagonist to flee through the vents, and after narrowly escaping this probably served as a first impression for the protagonist, and Catnap was only bringing our worst fears to reality. But what breaks this theory is the fact that the man speaking on the tape is talking directly to us about us leaving the building and coming back years later. Plus, he ends off his speech with saying, welcome home, which is most likely letting us know that we'll be killed here and never seen again, with our souls being a part of Playtime Co. for the rest of eternity. Welcome for this to be said though, something external would have to be affecting the way the hallucination is occurring, which is most likely Catnap and his gas, and they would have to know about what's going on regarding us coming back to the building. So with that being said, my second theory is that the demented Huggy Wuggy is the manifestation of our guilt, with the symbolism being that we couldn't escape him when he started to chase us. Think about it, we the player clearly left Playtime Co before the hour of joy occurred, as otherwise we would have been killed off during the event, but one thing is for sure, we were definitely 
definitely around when experiments were being conducted. Now, we know that the company was built in 1930 and ended up closing on August 8, 1995 because of the Hour of Joy. But we aren't given a date as to when we left, when we came back, or when the Hour of Joy specifically happened. But since the event resulted in almost every single staff being killed by the toys, it's pretty safe to say that Playtime Co. either shut down the day of or around the same week. However, it is said at some point in the game that the Bigger Bodies experiment started in the late 1980s or early 1990s, so just a few years before the Hour of Joy occurred. So for us to have either been a part of or seen the experiments going on, we would have had to be around during this time frame and i'm gonna say that we were simply because some of the experiments recognize us like miss delight wait i recognize you yes i remember you used to work here how are you Alive. Now, it said that after the experiment, the subject that they'd use wouldn't remember who they were, but it's unclear if they remember the people around them. But it's likely that we the player had some type of involvement with the experiments, or at the very least known about them. And now that everything is taking a turn for the worse, that feeling of guilt is starting to settle in. And if we go back to the tape before Huggy Wuggy comes out of the TV, pay attention to what he says. So should you come back tomorrow feeling unhappy for where you are? or what you've done. What you've done? Now this obviously isn't a tape for everyone who watches it. He's clearly talking to us and us alone. And he's making it clear that the toys are going to get revenge on the people that had any correlation to the experiment that made them this way. Now this is all making sense and it does help explain some things. But why is Huggy Wuggy the one who comes through the TV? Whether that be due to our guilt or the culmination of our worst fears coming to get us. Well, that leads me to my last theory. And I'm going to say that it's because Huggy Wuggy is the most most memorable and iconic toy in the entire company. Plus, again, he was our first encounter. And this could go way beyond the lore of the game, and it could be seen as an act of fan service. But if you look at the instructions video, Huggy Wuggy's face is still on the screen even before the actual hallucination occurs. But maybe the hallucination occurred way before, as we see Catnap stalking us in the shadows. And after Huggy Wuggy catches us and we most likely pass out, it would have made sense for Catnap to kill us right then and there. As well, the first picture of Huggy Wuggy is still a little bit unsettling and it doesn't look like something employees would be too fond of watching on their first day but if we're going off the fact that playtime code decided to use this picture of huggy wuggy for the video it would make sense that our hallucinations turns him into some demented creature what wouldn't make sense though is if they had huggy wuggy on the screen and then catnap popped out or mommy long legs or any other character and to be honest all three theories could play a part in why huggy wuggy popped up have you ever wondered how the smiling critters managed to completely possess dog day and turn him against us let him go please be please just go run Well, I have a couple theories on how this could have happened, with the last one seeming like the most accurate. But first, we have to figure out how Dog Day even got in this position in the first place. During the scene with Dog Day, he was talking about how he was the last of the smiling critters. But for some reason, he was still alive and chained up to the wall with his legs completely missing. Now, for the other members of the smiling critters, I'm led to believe that Catnap killed them off immediately after realizing that they weren't being controlled by the prototype, as mentioned by Ollie in one of the scenes. In Catnap's eyes, the prototype is a superhero and has saved this place. So Catnap treats him like a god, killing everyone that opposes him. And it seems like the prototype's control doesn't affect everyone as intended. So for specific toys, they have to use different methods. And for Dog Day, he was probably unlucky enough to still be alive when Catnap found us after the train crash. So we ate off his legs and prepared him for the evil transformation, which looks like it has something to do with an already converted toy or a mass of them affecting you through your insides in some way. But this might just be one of the ways that prototype's control can be put onto others as it's pretty unlikely that this happened for every toy and for my first theory i'm gonna say that the smiling critters merge together inside of dog day to form this one full being that's completely capable of controlling him as if you look at the scene where they all go inside of him it looks like there's way too many for them to have their own space as most went in through the bottom half 
and one even went through his eyes. And if you look at the way Dog Day moves after the transformation, you can see that his movements aren't random, or at least not of someone who's being controlled by multiple things at once, like a puppet with a bunch of strings attached. And this is most likely because the smiling critters inside of him managed to put themselves into one another and become the host of Dog Day's body. As well, after possessing Dog Day, you'll see that he goes from having fully black eye sockets with no pupils to suddenly having white pupils. And you don't see the smiling critters protruding anywhere inside of him because again, a lot of them went inside and it looks to be way too many to fit. But what makes this theory the least likely to have happened is the fact that if the smiling critters were to have merged inside of him, he would have still had his mind intact and he still would be able to talk to us during the chase. And once he's completely transformed, his voice even changes as whenever he jump scares us, this is what he sounds like. And for my second theory, I'm gonna say that the smiling critters ate Dog Day's insides to replace what they consumed. The main driving force behind me thinking that this might be true is what Dog Day was explaining to us. As before he got transformed, he mentioned that the smiling critters are watching us with empty stomachs, saying that they want nothing more than to crawl beneath our skin and eat away at us bit by bit and fill what feels empty inside themselves. A million pairs of eyes are on you now. Watching, waiting, hungry. They want nothing more than to crawl beneath your skin and eat away at you bit by little bit. Fill what feels empty inside themselves. And once the smiling critters arrive, the cries of agony that Dog Day makes is most likely them doing exactly what he was just talking about, eating away at him until he's nothing but a husk, allowing them to take full control of his body. As well, right before he's completely possessed, you can hear him choking, gargling, and he can't even talk. <laughs> And this is probably due to the fact that they ate away at his vocal cords, to the point where it just sounds scratchy and unrecognizable. Now this leads to the question, why would the smiling critters want to do that, not only to Dog Day, but to anyone that isn't under prototype's control? Well, if you listen to what Dog Day says before he gets possessed, the only reason they're behaving this way is out of fear that the prototype will treat them the same way they treated Dog Day, as he will kill anyone that doesn't follow his beliefs or fights his control. So they serve under Catnap, who is also under the prototype, and as a reward for their obedience, they are fed the toys and staff who are against the prototype. That thing, Catman, the prototype is his god, and this is what he does to heretics. These little toys follow Catman to avoid that very fate, and in return, you can also pair this with the hour of joy, as when you get to the end of the chapter, you meet up with Poppy, and she talks to us about the hour of joy. She presents the tape to us and plays it for us to watch on the TV, and you can see all of the experimented toys becoming sentient and killing every single staff member in the building, except us of course. But what stuck out to me is the fact that Poppy explains that the toys took everyone down to the bottom of the building after the killing to eat them, and the smiling critters is probably repeating that same behavior. And for all of the toys, after they got experimented on, they felt like they were missing something. And the only thing they felt was able to fill that hole was to kill and consume anything that wasn't a toy. All that death didn't fix anything. And then, once it was all over, they dragged those corpses down below where they'd never be found. And they ate the bodies to stay alive. And later, it became anything that wasn't a part of Prototype's control. And now for my last theory, and I'm gonna say that the smiling critters overrided Dog Day's mind with their evil, which is the same evil that Catnap and the prototype has. As when they ended up possessing Dog Day, you can see that they have complete control over him and there's no sign of him being able to fight back. He's gone completely, and now his only objective is to pursue and kill us. But I'm led to believe that he wasn't completely dead during the chase scene, as he's still able to move, and since his movements didn't look puppet-like, his thoughts Thoughts and intentions have most likely been overrided by the smiling critters. As well, you can see him going from trying to fight back 
to immediately pursuing the player, showing that his mind is only on one thing, and that's killing us. But this also goes back to the hour of joy, as Poppy explained that everything that happened was just senseless murder, and something just snapped inside of all of the toys, and that's what caused all of the killing. And that evil and murderous intent looks to be transferable, as Dog Day goes from being an ally to becoming a mindless murderer. Now, earlier, I did mention how I'm led to believe that Dog Day wasn't completely dead during the chase scene, but right after the scene finishes and we manage to escape Dog Day via a jump pad, you can hear Dog Day screaming in the background, and this could mean a bunch of different things. Firstly, the screams don't actually sound like Dog Day and it seems to be some demented form or cry of agony from the smiling critters finally killing him off like the rest of the crew after realizing that we escaped. It could also be a cry of frustration from the smiling critters that we escaped, which means that the prototype will kill them for not catching us the same way he killed Catnap at the end of the chapter. Or it could just be the noises of the transformation fully completing, but this is unlikely since Dog Day seemed to have already been converted. Who attacked Kissy Missy? After defeating Catnap through the prototype and moving the red smoke over to the left tube in the gas production zone, we meet up with Poppy and she begins to praise us for everything that we've done. She then says that we deserve to know the truth of what happened to Playtime Co. and presents a tape to us that they like to call the hour of joy. And after watching this, Kissy Missy comes through the large door on the left and helps bring us down to the bottom of the room via an elevator. And Poppy lets Kissy Missy know that we'll send the lift back up to her once we reach the bottom. But as we're going down, all we can hear is Kissy Missy screaming and stomping around, with Poppy trying her absolute best to get back to her. All right, once we hit the ground, we need to be cautious. There's something... And with that, the chapter ends. But who could have attacked Kissy Missy? Why did they do it? And how will this change things moving forward? Well, I have three theories for what could have happened to her. But let's start with the least likely. When Kissy Missy is first being attacked, listen to the very first noise she makes. Sound familiar? Well, this is actually the exact same noise Huggy Wuggy makes when he jump scares us. But why would Kissy Missy make this noise in the first place? Well, lots of people are led to believe that it was actually Huggy Wuggy himself that made the first noise. But if we were to assume that both of them were in the room, then it would make the rest of the attack make zero sense. On top of the screaming, you can hear Kissy Missy stomping around, but you can't hear any other footsteps. If Huggy Wuggy was the one to attack her, the footsteps would have been either doubled or a lot more rapid. Plus, how would Huggy Wuggy even have gotten there in the first place? And why would he immediately attack Kissy Missy? I can somewhat understand the second part, as the reason he attacked us in the first chapter is likely just because he was starving. This is because, before the Hour of Joy happened, Huggy Wuggy was said to be very obedient with the staff and normally didn't lash out. But things started to slowly take a turn for the worse once Huggy Wuggy started to be influenced by the prototype. And so, he ended up only being hostile when provoked to being a relentless killer. But what about him actually being alive in the first place? During the end of chapter 1, we can clearly see Huggy Wuggy falling deep into the depths of Playtime Co. And the only chance he could have had at surviving is if he landed in a large body of water. Now, we're seen to be navigating through bodies of water throughout chapter 3, but it's highly unlikely that this was enough to break Huggy Wuggy's fall. Plus, I don't think the water that we see in chapter 3 is right below Poppy's walkway. But who else could have attacked Kissy Missy? Now, everyone's instinctive answer for the attack 
is the prototype, but we actually have nothing proving this. It's been shown that the prototype will only become involved with a toy who is either already dead or is on the verge of death. And if he were to not stick by this, it would completely change why the prototype is keeping himself hidden as much as possible in the first place. But it is possible that the prototype had some type of involvement with the attack. And for this, we have to go all the way back to the playhouse. After we find Dog Day in one of the jail cells, he starts to tell us how he got in this position, and during his dialogue, he says this. <laughs> I tried to fight it. The prototype's control. Now, this can be taken one of two ways. The first is the prototype actually being able to manipulate your mind and turn you evil, and the second is the prototype just having a bunch of control over all the other toys, meaning it would be very difficult to defy him. If we were to go with the first way, it's possible that the prototype started to try and control Kissy Missy and turn her evil, which is why we don't hear anyone else stomping around or screaming. All of this could be mental for Kissy Missy, and in the next chapter, we might have to turn her back to her good ways. The way he got Huggy Wuggy to go from obedient to ruthless will probably be used on Kissy Missy as well. But right now, we really have nothing to go off of. We can't see what's going on with Kissy Missy, and the only thing we can really use as info is what we heard. There was never a point in the game where Kissy Missy was said to have any type of enemy, and the only character that's in relation to Kissy Missy is Huggy Wuggy. And again, he was supposedly killed way back in chapter 1. So if no one had having any past reasons to attack Kissy Missy, this had to have been orchestrated by someone else. This brings me back to the prototype, but instead of him being the person to do it directly, it's possible that he sent another character to do the job, and maybe it's a character we haven't even seen yet. Lots of people have been speculating on not just what will happen for the next chapter, but who's going to be the main antagonist for it. I don't think chapter 4 will be the last chapter, so that would also mean that the prototype can't be the last character we have to take down. So with that being said, could it be possible that the person who attacked Kissy Missy will also be the main antagonist of chapter 4? It's a bit of a stretch, but again, we don't really have much to back anything up. Plus, after being attacked by Kissy Missy after leaving home sweet home, Poppy lets us know on the elevator that Catnap was the last obstacle he put between us. Catnap is coming. He's the final obstacle the prototype has placed against us can't stay here. Keep yourself safe. So wouldn't that mean that he couldn't send anyone else down to us? It also makes me wonder how Poppy even has this information, but more about that in another theory. One thing that I will mention though is how Kissy Missy ended up being attacked in the first place. If you look at where the lever is that sends the lift down and where Kissy Missy is when she pulls it, you can see that the entrance to the room is right behind her, which means that whoever attacked her must have snuck into the room and then pounced onto her. This is also why I wouldn't think of Huggy Wuggy being the main culprit, as he doesn't strike me as the quiet type. Now, Catnap is said to be a stealthy character, but he literally just got killed, so that also takes him off the list. Now you could say Boxy Boo is considered stealthy, but there are so many things wrong with him possibly attacking Kissy Missy. But there is one group of characters who could possibly fit the bill on this and it could be the mini smiling critters. Earlier in the video, I mentioned how you can hear Kissy Missy stomping around as she's screaming, and I linked this with someone trying to control her. But what if this was due to the fact that there were a bunch of toys latched onto her, causing her to become disoriented? Just based off the noises Kissy Missy makes when she's attacked, we can infer that she's not really trying to fight back. It honestly sounds like screams for help. But the thing about pinning the attack on any character is that you can't hear anyone other than Kissy Missy in the room. So we kind of just have to go off of who has evil intentions. And now we have to speculate how this changes the story and what's to come for the next chapter. Firstly, we have to figure out why Poppy was bringing us deeper into Playtime Co. in the first place. She said multiple times that we need to kill the prototype. So her bringing us down to wherever this new place is, is probably so we can do exactly that. But now that Kissy Missy has been attacked, I think a large portion of the next chapter will be centered around saving her and figuring out who was the one who attacked her. And perhaps after that, then we'll go back to the original plan of taking down the prototype. But even then, it might be too late. But who do you think attacked Kissy Missy? And will we be able to see them in the upcoming chapter? Let me know down in the comments. Thanks for watching. Subscribe and click on this video right here.